Hi. Like and subscribe for the more true horror stories. Story one. I know where them bodies are, the boy said. Sheriff Burke had the skinny 15-year-old sitting in one of the two wooden chairs on the other side of his desk. He knew the kid, knew him well enough to notice he was wearing his Sunday best, loose-fitting hand-me-downs that hung like clothes on a scarecrow. But still, in these parts anyway, dapper enough for God, Burke reached for his cup of hot coffee. And what bodies are those, Seth? The boy pulled a Bible from under his arm and set it on the desk. The ones you and Deputy Wayne been looking for. Seth took a quick look around. Where is the deputy? Anyhow, Burke followed the boy's gaze around the tiny police station. It was a place anyone could take in at a glance. Two desks and a small dispatch area decked out in equipment circa 1967 made up the brunt of the station's innards. Toward the rear of the one-room station was a long window hidden behind worn drapes the color of dried blood and to iron-barred holding cells. An orange discoloration peppered the bars and locks locks so old Burke wasn't even sure if they worked. Not that it mattered much in a quiet, mostly forgotten place like Thankful, Alabama. I usually hold down the fort solo on Sundays. Catch up on paperwork and all. Now go on, Burke said, sitting back, his chair creaking under the strain. What bodies are you talking about? The boy glanced down at his hands then said, Evans Parker and that teacher, Miss. Conroy. Burke leaned forward a bit, caressing his cup. I don't know what you've heard, Seth, but them are just missing persons. The boy looked up at Burke. Don't play games, Sheriff. What I'm talking about is just between you. Me, Seth slapped his hand on the Bible and God. Burke did his best to show no reaction, but he looked at the thick book. The Holy Doctrine looked older than he and the boy put together. Flecks of aged paper splintered off as Seth's pressed down on its cracked leather cover. The boy slid his hand off the Bible and into his lap. You don't call the state police or them government folks for no missing persons. As God is my shepherd, I know you don't. Burke rotated the handle of his cup around to his other hand. Steam gently rose above the rim. If you got something to get off your chest out with it. The boy leaned in and Burke thought the kid's eyes had suddenly turned the color of night beetles the kind that swarmed around the porch light in the summer. There was blood, wasn't there? Seth said all over Evan Parker's garage and MS. Conray's kitchen? A grin played on his mouth. Butcher didn't find no bodies, did ya? In a place like Thankful, it was harder than Chinese arithmetic to keep any kind of secret, let alone one like what he and Wayne were trying to keep regarding the crime scenes. He'd kept a tight lip, but wasn't sure about Wayne. The sheriff had bumped into his deputy more than once at Millie's Tavern impressing the liquor dub locals with some embellished tale of life on the beat. The facts about the blood at both scenes in pools on the floors and in Jackson Pollock splatters on the walls would have made one terrific barroom story. Be a miracle if Wayne had managed to keep his mouth shut. Burke lowered his cup onto the desk like a dragonfly touching down on a Cahaba lily. You want to tell me how you know about that? Because I know who killed Tam. Was it you? Seth. Seth smiled and looked down at his hands again. No. Sheriff. It weren't me. Well, son, you have my attention. It was my cousin, Haley. Burke sighed. Seth, I know how close you and your cousin were. I'm sure her death hit you pretty hard, and when we find the son bitch that run her down like a dog in the street, I'll personally hold the bastard so you and your kin can get some justice. But till that day comes, Seth, you got to get on. The boy sniffled, but his eyes remained dry. I loved her like a sister. If we weren't blood, we might have. I don't know. Seth looked up, his eyes glassy. Fact is, I always knew she were special. Just didn't know how much till she called me one night. What night? The night that teacher, Miss. Conroy disappeared. Burke sat back deep into his chair and folded his arms across his chest. See, she was in an awful panic, Seth said. Needed my help real bad, but wouldn't say what for. She told me to come over to Miss. Conroy's go round back, she says. Don't let nobody see you. So I does as she say. What happened, Seth? Well, I goes round and she's at the back door holding open the screen. 
In the moonlight, I could see your hands were covered with something dark and dripping. Her overalls and cheeks were smeared with it too. I wasn't but to steps up that porch before I could smell the blood. Awful powerful. The boy paused and Burke wondered if it was for effect or whether he was actually reliving the moment. Seth, why was Haley covered in blood? Why do you think? Seth dipped his head forward. A strand of greasy black hair fell across his forehead, making his face look more sinister than his age normally allowed. Because she had just slit that sow from chin to birth and hole, that's why. I walked in that kitchen and nearly got sick on myself, swear to God. If I hadn't slipped on a heap of gizzards, I surely would have. The fall onto my ass left me staring up at Haley and that big knife she was caressing like it was the baby Jesus. That sight kind of helped me focus and I forgot all about being nauseous. Burke studied the young man. Seth brushed the strand of hair back. I think right then I was going to scream, or maybe I did. Don't know for sure, but she shushed me and said I need to show you something. I sat there in a pile of that teacher's insides and watched Haley walk over to the body. It was phased to the floor and she stepped over it, then hunkered down on the big dead woman's back. She reached forward, pulled the head up by the hair and run the blade hard across the forehead. Fast light. Then she yanked that teacher's scalp clean off. I remember saying, what the hell, Haley, or some such thing. She just shook her head and pointed with the knife down at the woman's skull. Do you see him? She said. I didn't at first, but then I did. See what? Burke said. Horns? Seth answered. Tiny little horns. About an inch high. Maybe two coming right out of her skull. They must have been sticking out through the top of her head, but with all that hair, who would know? Haley let the head fall, and it hit the wooded floorboard with a smack that sent blood into my eyes. By the time I'd wiped it away, Haley had yanked the woman's pants down, showing me the teacher's backside. She cut the undergarment down the middle and encouraged me to come closer. The stench was worse than the one that hit me when I walked in. Miss. Conroy had sort of let go with everything, you know. I get it. Burke nodded. Go on. Geez, Haley just stuck her hand in there and pushed it all aside. I know I gagged hard then. When I come up, Haley was pulling something out. It was attached just above the woman's bottom, about a roll of quarters thick and near to foot long. What was it? A tail. I swear on my grandmother's grave. It was a tail. Must have been tucked deep down, hidden in her backside. Burke smirked and a slight chuckle escaped his lips. Seth held up his right hand like a boy scout. God is my witness, I swear it, Sheriff. It was a tail. The tip was shaped like a big Indian arrow head. Seth brought his hand down, leaned forward and lowered his voice. Conroy, that teacher, she'd been schooling third graders for almost 20 years and nobody knew, except my cousin. Nobody ever suspected that she were a devil, a real, from the depths of hell, devil. Seth sat back, closed his thin lips firmly, and to Burke they looked like someone had laid a night crawler across the boy's face, both ends wiggling up the sides of his cheeks. A devil. Burke shook his head. Son, have you gone crazy? No, sir, but there are times I wish I had. You see, Haley told me the whole thing right there in that kitchen she turned into a slaughterhouse. There are devils all around us, sent up from hell not doing anything wrong, just wait. Fur what? Seth. Waitin' fur what? Seth eyes narrow. The final battle. The one between God and the serpent. Hell is sending up its soldiers in preparation, getting them in position for the war. The last war. Burke shook his head. Seth O'Haley had the sight. A gift from God so she could see. She says it were like having x-ray vision. And she knew what God needed her to do. The sheriff took a deep breath. So, if she has got this gift from God, what did she need you for? Seth smiled. Well, you remember how big that Conroy woman was. Near 300 pounds if she's an ounce. Haley couldn't move her by herself. Now that Evans Parker fellow, hell, he was only 140 soaking wet, and she said she took care of him, no problem. But miss, Conroy well, she hadn't thinked ahead. So you helped her move the body. Sure enough. Like I said, Sheriff, I loved her like a sister, and I love God too. So when you think on it, what choice did I have? Burke's brow furrowed. 
You had a dozen choices, you little shit. Call me, for one. Where did you move the body? Seth hung his head. Was it shame on the kid's face? Or simply the expression one wears when remembering how messy moving a gutted 300-pound corpse could be? You know where Thankful Church Road bends? I'll buy Jim Holsey's place. Yeah, ever since Mrs. Holsey died, God rest her soul. Jim sort of let her big old garden overgrow. It's just weeds now, but the scarecrow they made some ten years ago is still there. We buried all that we could carry of Miz. Conroy under that scarecrow. It's where Haley also hid Parker's body. I think more are buried there because of all the piles of upturned earth, but I never asked her about it. Seth turned his face as if he didn't want the sheriff to look at it anymore. I didn't really get a chance to ask her. Not really. She were run down two days later. Seth, you better not be horsing around here. If what you're saying is true, you're in a world of trouble, son. Seth wiped away a tear. How do you figure, Sheriff? Well, for starters, how about two counts of Aiden and a Betton after the fact, and one count of accessory to murder? Sheriff, ain't you been listening? There were no murders. They's devils. Killing devils is God's work. Ain't no murder about it. No, sir. Seth, I hope to God that on some level you know how much horse shit you're spewing. Damn, son. Ain't no devils in thankful. The boy's eyes, glassy but focused, met Burks. I need you to believe me. Sheriff. Hell, I believe you believe it. Burke sat his still full cup on the desk. Now let's you and me take a little ride out to Holsey's place. I don't think you understand, Sheriff Burke. Seth jumped up and put a hand on the Bible. I didn't come here to make a confession. Burke got to his feet, not as fast as the boy, but steady and watchful. Seth flipped open the leather cover, reached in, and pulled something black and metallic out of the hollowed-out pages. The kid aimed the old revolver at Burke's chest. I come here today to kill me a devil. Burke looked back and forth from the Bible's pages, hollowed out in the shape of a gun, to the black short barrel pointed at his chest. It was a small revolver, the kind most hunters carried for that final shot when the one that brought the animal down had failed to kill. Oh Christ, son, what the... You see, when Haley died, it were passed to me. The gift. I got the sight now, and I can see those horns under your scalp. Seth pointed to Burke's head with the revolver, then slowly down to his groin. Burke's mouth went dry and his testicles retracted. Your tail ain't as long as that myth. Conroy's, but I can seize it all the same. You're trying to hide it by wrapping it round your thigh, but it don't work against someone who got the sight. Seth! You're crazy. I don't have a tail. Jesus day. Christ. Burke still had his hand near his cup, and he slowly looped to fingers inside the handle. I'll drop my pants right now and show ya if you want, just don't do anything stupid. Sorry. Sheriff, I know my duty, and you're one devil that won't be around for the final battle. Seth pulled the hammer back. It made a rusty click. Now hold on, as quick as a gator snatches a meal from the water's edge, Burke scooped up the coffee mug and thrust the scolding hot liquid into Seth's face. The boy screamed, tottered. Burke was quick. He leaned over the desk and clamped his beefy hand around the back of Seth's neck and slammed his face into the desk, blood inked the desk blotter. He let the boy's unconscious body fall back into the chair. Crazy, son bitch, Burke said, wiping his forehead. He could tell by the cracking sound when the face hit the desk that he'd broken the boy's nose, and by the way one of his cheeks sagged, Burke figured that wasn't all that was broke. He moved around to where Seth was slumped. Bending down, he picked the boy up in his arms and carried him to the back of the station. Pushing open one of the iron gates with his foot, he moved into a holding cell. With all the gentleness he could muster for a boy who had just thrust a gun in his face, Burke lay Seth on a canvas cock. He returned to his desk and stared at the revolver. The trigger guard was dripping coffee. The hammer was still cocked, a haunting reminder of how close he'd come to meeting his maker. Crazy. Son bitch. He used a pencil to lift the gun by the trigger guard. He returned the handgun to its hollowed out spot in the Bible. Flipping the pencil around, he used the rubber end to close the book's heavy leather-bound cover. He exchanged the pencil for an old cracked ruler, and he pushed the Bible toward the edge of the desk like a man sweeping refuse out of his garage. 
It fell over the edge, tumbling end over end into an aluminum waste basket, where it lay with crumpled paper, a moldy banana peel, and pencil shavings. Burke shook his head, son bitch. He walked back to the cell, stepped inside, and closed the iron bars behind him. How many of them were there? It seemed like every time he got rid of one, another took its place. And always teens. What the hell is God's preoccupation with making champions out of teenagers? It didn't matter. When the final battle comes, Burke would be there to do his part, and no child champion of God was gonna have a say in it. Whether Burke had to run them down in the street like dogs or squeeze the life out of them with his bare hands, he'd do whatever it took to see the rightful lord and master walk the earth again. Burke knelt beside the unconscious boy. He felt his eyes turn blood red and the horns beneath his scalp tingled with excitement. Then he placed his devil hands around the boy's throat. Story 2 The far-off unfocused stare of a corpse is something that still unnerves me. Their gaze locked onto a spot somewhere out beyond the physical realm, the milky haze of the degrading cornea acting like a barrier between the living world and the endless black void of their saucer-sized pupils. That I can handle. It freaks me out, but I can handle it. I crouched beside the body, taking in its grotesque form. But this, this was unfucking natural The body was male, mid-twenties. Skin barely stretched over bone and nearly mummified with patches of blackened skin resembling frostbite. He sat in a high back rolling chair, slouched forward in front of his computer, one bony hand on the keyboard, the other on the mouse. His sunken eyes were set on the screen, his gaunt slack jawed face transfixed by the blank monitor. Neighbors said they hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks. Dover leaned against the doorframe and flipped his notebook closed. I stood, eager to get away from the corpse's dreamy expression, and they didn't think that was unusual. He shook his head. The kid was a shut-in. The landlord only checked on him because rent was due. I stood back, taking in the macabre scene. It's like he didn't realize he was dying. What do you think he was looking at that was so engrossing? Dover gave me a sideways glance and a knowing smile. It might not be porn, you know. I mean, both of his hands are on the desk. The station was bustling per usual for a Monday morning. The smell of burnt coffee mixed with poor choices and aftershave and cologne were suffocating. I sat at my desk opposite Dover's, mine stacked with manila folders and random documents to be filled out or filed, and is spotless with the exception of a couple of tchotchke of unknown origin. It had been a week since the emaciated corpse had been found, and I held the freshly delivered coroner's report in my hands. I skimmed rapidly through the medical jargon on my way to the summary page. Severe organ damage, likely from dehydration and malnutrition. I shook my head in disbelief. How does an otherwise healthy person just let themselves die like that? Suicide? Dover said, reading the report over my shoulder. I exchanged the file for the proffered cup of coffee in his hand. There are a lot quicker, less painful methods than slowly dehydrating to death. He nodded taking a seat. Jenna Harkins, one of the officers, knocked timidly on the door before stepping in. Detective Gable, you two are working that mummified corpse case, right? Yeah, but there's not much to work. It looks like an accidental death. Well then, I guess I have some bad news for you. I took a bracing gulp from my cup, then gestured the go-ahead. There are more. A lot more. 38 deaths in total peppered the country. Wasted, emaciated bodies found at their computers, game consoles, or in front of their TVS. Some clutching cell phones and tablets in a rigor death grip. The cases were ruled accidental then closed without much thought, until more steadily began to roll in. It didn't take long for the labels to switch from accidental to suspicious. We managed to trace the first known case back to early December, two days after the worst blizzard the state had seen in decades. Dover requested archives to be on the lookout for any similar cases occurring before our suspected victim zero. Speculation began to circulate about the cause of the mysterious deaths, ranging from cult activity to SGT. Vickers less accepted occult activity, but the more withered corpses I saw, the more I began to believe Vickers. 
So far they've all been male. Between 18 and 65, I thought out loud as Dover strode ahead, ducking under the yellow tape, then stretching it overhead, allowing me to pass beneath. And they were all using some kind of electronic device capable of connecting to the internet. I weaved through uniforms to the living room of the small bungalow. Jenna approached looking worse for wear and obviously rattled. The Adler, 38, sister found him, she said, handing me the deceased driver's license and wallet. She then gestured to the couch and remains. I hesitated at the sight, wanting to scramble back out of the room and away from that face. I closed my eyes against the image, but it was already burned into my mind. The body reclined on an overstuffed sofa, its feet on the coffee table, and upper body propped up on one skeletal arm. The skin was stretched tight, every bone protruding so fiercely they could have burst through the waxy coating at the slightest touch. The head crooked downward, but I could still see the lidless sunken eyes, sharp and focused, the lips so thin they had drawn back in a toothy smile, and the nose and fingers blackened at their tips. I knelt beside the sofa, following the corpse's gaze down to a cell phone cradled loosely in one hand. I reached out, gently grabbing the edge and began wiggling it free. The hand snapped shut around the phone. I reeled backward into Dover, who caught me under my arms and brought me to my feet. He moved. I could barely get the words out. I could see the skeletal figure trying to work its jaw and manipulate its tongue, but the jaw made a horrible grinding noise and the tongue fell to pieces in its mouth. Get the paramedics. He's still alive. The Adler didn't make it to the hospital. As far as I could tell, he didn't make it to the ambulance. His sister sobbed hysterically in the passenger seat of one of the squad cars parked out front, an officer doing his best to console her. She said she talked to him this morning. They were supposed to meet up. That's why she came to check on him. Jenna trembled as she spoke, then excused herself to answer a call coming in over the dispatch radio clip to her shoulder. Another week went by with more bodies being reported. We'd done everything we could to keep the strange deaths out of the news, but the media picked up on it, and the cyber serial murders quickly became a sensation. We warned people to limit their computer usage, to stay off the internet unless absolutely necessary, but the deaths trended on every social media platform and were the most popular search on all major search engines, so a fat lot of good that did. It felt like a never-ending series of events, leaving no time for sleep or even a small respite. Dover sat jotting down notes from case files, powered by toxic levels of caffeine and willpower, while I reclined at my desk, phone pressed against my ear, hoping for some good news from the chief Emmy. I've examined them all, detective. There's no sign of disease, injury, or illness, none that would result in death anyway, and now, I don't think we can rely on time of death either. Why not? The last victim, Adler, his organ temperature at death was already in line with ambient temperature. It should have taken several hours to fall such a degree. I'm sorry, detective, but I'm at a loss. I pinched the bridge of my nose and thanked Dry. Rosenfield for her time before hanging up, then sat staring at the photos of shriveled faces laid out in full horrific color until a sudden shrillness roused me from thought. A great deal of commotion was coming from the lobby. I sprinted down the hallway and into the clerk's office with Dover at my heels. A group of people were shouting and waving their arms in the air on the other side of the safety glass, trying to get the attention of the desk clerk, who refused to look up from his laptop. Dover tried to settle the restless crowd while I crept up behind the clerk peering over his shoulder. Peters, what the hell are you doing? He ignored me, continuing to stare at the computer screen. A young woman, 18 or 20 years old, stared back. She smiled, fixing her black snowflake dotted hair as it fluttered in the wind. Her nearly translucent skin blended in with the fallen snow around her. Sunlight streamed through icy pine boughs in the background, wrapping the girl in a halo of warm yellow light. Somehow she seemed familiar. I was sure I knew her face, but I couldn't recall where I'd seen her. It was then I noticed a chill in the air and saw Peters creating little puffs of steam with each breath. The young woman stopped to stare directly into the camera, locking eyes with the entranced clerk. He was held captive by her gaze, wearing a dreamy expression as though he were staring at a high school crush. 
A notification sounded as a pop-up window appeared over the video. Invite Yuki to chat? The clerk hovered over the accept button, Yuki smiling and slowly nodding her encouragement. Yuki? That name. That face. I knew this girl somehow. The click of the mouse startled me. Wait. I was too late. Yuki shook with a soundless laugh, her features shifting, eyes darkening and lips taking on a bluish hue. Her black hair whipped in the wind, hiding her face. Dover made a move toward me, but I waved him off. I could feel the frosty air cutting through, chilling my blood. Still in a stupor-like state, the clerk let out a sigh of steamy vapor that poured from his mouth gathering into a steady stream of mist flowing toward the laptop screen. What the hell? I took a step back into the warmth of the office, then watched in horror as his face became taut and his eyes sunk deep into their sockets as more of the misty breath flowed from his mouth. Peters, snap out of it? I grabbed him by the shoulders, shaking him violently, but he didn't so much as blink. Dover lunged at the desk grabbing the laptop, slamming the screen shut. Peter stirred, beginning to regain control, only to double over in agony as the mist continued to escape his lips. I turned the computer over ripping out the battery and tossing it to the floor by the clerk's wails of pain grew as he dropped to his knees, writhing on the dirty linoleum. Shit! 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 I looked wildly around the office for anything to stop the invisible onslaught. Dover rushed to the large blinking modem on the back wall, grabbed the cord feeding, and ripped it from the outlet. Peters let out a final sigh before his body sagged, becoming quiet and still. Now, we had seen it ourselves, and there was no arresting him. That girl haunted me more than the smiling, mummified faces of her victims. I knew I'd seen her face and heard her name. I stood at the missing persons board. Black and white photos and artist sketches stared back at me like a grim wallpaper design. The edge of a flyer caught my eye. It was just the corner of a grin and a name. Yuki Masaki? I grabbed the flyer, yanking it from the board. Two months ago, 19-year-old Yuki Masaki went missing and was marked down as a runaway. I'd walked by her picture every day for a month before the other flyers overtook her. Dover watched the solemn gathering of Peter's body as he was prepared to be taken to the M.E. Though at that point, an autopsy seemed trivial. A YouTube video sucked the life out of him. I'd like to see that typed up on the cause of death line. I handed Dover the flyer. That's the girl from the video. She went missing the same time these bodies started cropping up. Not a runaway then. Probably not. The tech guys worked wonders, as they tended to do. The station's computer traffic was monitored around the clock and they were able to tell us the video that killed Peters came in as a live stream from a cell phone and with a little more time they would be able to give an exact location. A response unit was forming, but we couldn't wait. Calls we still coming in reporting bodies being found on trains and in internet cafes, we had to find the source as soon as possible. The team pointed us in the direction of a mountainous area of the national park just outside city limits. The signal came from over a mile off the marked trail, well into the white, craggy woods. Snow hung heavy on the pines, bending their branches low, making them creak in the slightest breeze. The sun was beginning to set and the blinding white of the snow softened into something a bit warmer in color, though it did nothing for the near sub-zero temperature. The signal was remarkably strong for being so far into what should have been a dead zone. Dover and I crunched through the knee-high snow, making steady progress toward the last location we'd been given. You hear that? Dover said, stopping to cup his hand around his ear. What is it? I stood as still as I could, but all I could hear were the trees complaining under the weight of wet snow, crying. The wind kicked up around us, gusting through the thinning pines, pushing the fallen snow back into the air as a blinding ground blizzard. Dover, I called out for him, but my voice was thrown back at me. I couldn't see or hear anything through the roaring snow. He'd been less than 10 feet away on my right. I tried to move in his direction, hand outstretched, but I was blown backward onto my original path. The sound of a woman weeping rose over the frosted tempest, drawing me forward. With a few steps, I passed through the frigid squall into a muted clearing. I was frozen, not from the three-dog night, but from absolute terror. Black hair and black eyes met me. 
They seem to hover unanchored to a physical form, the hair flowing freely as though it were submerged in a clear lake. When the last streaks of sunlight sank behind the mountains casting cold blue shadows, I could see it plainly. A nude woman, skin so pale she blended in with the surrounding snow, eyes like an endless black void and hair that moved and shifted in graceful fluidity obscuring her face. Yukimasaki? The woman made no sign of acknowledgement, continuing to glide toward me leaving the snow undisturbed as she passed through the drifts. Stop right there. I drew my side arm, aiming at the approaching figure. She opened her arms, beckoning me toward her. My arms fell to my sides and the pistol slipped from my hand, disappearing beneath the snow. I stepped closer, unable to stop or look away from her terrible beauty. Gable, Dover, Jenna's voice shattered the silence. Lights swept across the clearing where I stood, alone and shivering. A thick mist hung in the spot where the woman had been and the raging storm behind me was gone. Jenna and a team of ten other officers burst through the wall of pines, flooding the area with light and sound. It took less than an hour to find the remains of Yuki Masaki, her cell phone clutched in her withered, frost-bitten hand, the battery long dead. The last person to see Yuki alive was her boyfriend, who sobbed out a confession of leaving the girl beaten and stranded to be consumed by the blizzard. Yuki's body was returned to her family and buried. The cyber serial murders stopped. We searched for Dover for weeks. A dedicated team combed the woods from first shift to last. By mid-March, the snow began to melt. We found his revolver lying on the forest floor, but no other sign of him. Eventually, the search team was recalled and his case went cold. I knew we wouldn't find him alive. I'd known that when we didn't find him the first night of the search, but we'd been together too long for me to just let him rot in that forsaken forest. I took an extended leave, under the guise of needing some time away. Hey, Gable? Jenna sprinted up behind me, waving a plump manila envelope as I unlocked my car. These are from archives, something Dover requested. I thought you might want it. I slid the package under my arm and thanked her. Are you going to be okay? I don't know, I answered honestly, sliding a box containing the tchotchke of unknown origin into my car. I drove out to the national park and walked the mile off the marked trail to where Dover had gone missing. I set up a tent and gathered stones and wood for a fire pit. I wasn't going to leave until I found him. The night air coated every available surface with a thin frost. I huddled next to the fire as close as I could without bursting into flames. I withdrew the thick envelope marked archives from my backpack and began leafing through the enclosed papers. Cases identical to the cyber serial murders stretched back to the station's founding in the early 1850s. They lacked the electronic element, but hundreds of male corpses resembling those of the latest victims were discovered all over the mountain and surrounding forest. Occasionally, couples were reported missing, with the man being found a mummified husk and the woman never being found at all. One case stood out from the others, this case left a witness. I read in stunned silence as the air around me grew cold in spite of the rolling flames. A father and his young son, on a weekend camping trip, were caught in a freak blizzard in early spring. When they were found by park rangers the next day, the father had been reduced to a withered collection of bones and tattered skin. The son, unharmed, told of hearing crying in the forest, then seeing a woman in white, who he described as a beautiful goddess with long black hair. He said she sang to him before disappearing into a snowy mist. A blast of icy wind shook the trees and tore the papers from my hand, blowing them into the air and scattering them around the firestone pit. I quickly snatched them off the ground before another wind could tear through the clearing. I looked up to see Dover's thin, twisted figure slumped inches away, the dancing light casting shadows on his weathered face. Jesus, Dover. Snow began to fall in large flakes, heavier and faster with each passing second. A wailing cry bounced around the darkened pines as I grabbed my pistol. I knew it wouldn't do any good to run. Story 3 When I was a kid, my stepfather asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. A magician, I answered quickly with worldwide clarity. He huffed at that answer. That ain't a job, son. Wearing makeup and doing a little dance at parties ain't a job to see. Best start looking yonder. 
I took exception to that and returned with I said a magician, not a clown, asshole. That earned me a good throttling, something I've always had a knack for goading. Sad to say, he ended up being right about that fact, as my dreams of being the next Harry Handcuff Houdini never came to pass. So, I took his advice and looked yonder. Eventually, that led to me becoming a cop. Honestly, I wish I could tell you a noble reason behind that choice, like the desire to help my community or saving the world one life at a time. But as my mother used to put it, only the devil fiddles lies. I spent six years working the graveyard patrol. Shifts were divvied up based on seniority, landing me in the nocturnal hours. I didn't mind much. At least, not at the time anyway. The first watch started at 10.30 p.m. and ended at 7.15 a.m. I'd monitor the empty streets. Nothing kept me company but coast-to-coast -coast radio and the mind-numbing click of my turn signal. Every hour or so, dispatch generously sent out a safety check to keep us sharp and awake. Kind of them, but not all that necessary. Nothing far-reaching ever happened in Colby, much less at 2.30 in the morning. With a population of five, 500, crimes were low and life fairly slow-paced. Occasionally, petty crimes run the gambit of traffic offenses, domestic disturbances, or underage drinking. In a town with little to offer its younger cliques, alcohol took precedence. We were as rural as Thomas County had to offer. Halfway to everywhere. No tall trees or rolling hills. Just blue sky-kissing prairie, there's no place like home. At 2.45 in the morning, the soft robotic voice of dispatch radioed a 2137 to one criminal trespass. Even before the details, I already had a hunch where I'd be heading. I pulled onto the interstate, pushed up to 70, and held it there as the town lights became spectral dots in the rear view. At 15 minutes out, the silos of the Windsor Mill Grain elevator were inevitably visible. Once upon a time, the huge structures were used to stockpile grain, thousands by the bushel. But in an unforeseen tragedy, a fire ripped its way through the facility, killing for workers in the process. Left in financial ruin, the elevator was shut down and condemned, but not quite abandoned. Its old, charred skeleton still belonged to the owner Alf Windsor, the same man who had made the distress call tonight. The place had naturally become a beacon for tourists to explore and hoodlums to tag, so for Windsor, trespassing calls were typical. Despite his relationship with the place equating to a dead limb, he never stopped safeguarding his perished property. I pulled the cruiser onto the dirt path that sloped toward the fenced entrance. Ralph Windsor's hunched figure was waiting by his truck. He was a burly man, face pinched with wrinkles and a mat of hair that rested greasily over his scowl. Evening, Ralph, I greeted, crunching up the gravel toward him. Kid sneaking in the pool again? He eyed me humorlessly and tweezed out another cigarette, a nasal twang guiding his voice. Something else, I reckon. I followed him through the gate and across the foregone lot. The silos stood in 15-foot clusters over us, enormous gravestones marred by a great blaze. Adjacent to them was the decrepit ruins of the warehouse, its roof collapsed in sunder and the lower half reclaimed by nature. A breeze of rust-scented wind scraped my nostrils. The incident had brought to light some safety violations as well as poor evacuation measures. To this day, Windsor was never keen on those details, not even after questioning by the media. Despite pushing 83, he still had a firm farmer-like stride. Cut a hole in my fence, probably on camera too. I heard him sneaking around the basement area. Figured it was just some little shits come to tag. Nah, these were men hooting and hollering things down there I'd never heard in my life. A bunch of gibberish speak. We walked along the haggard north side of the silos and came to a gaping hole punched into the concrete the entrance to the basement. How many would you say you heard? I asked him. Three, maybe four of them. I would have gone down there to scare him off, but his sundered face slackened. It sounded like there was a tussle, like they was fixin' to hurt someone down there. Does it sound like they have weapons? Any gunshots? He shook his head and replied, not that I heard. I crawled through the hole, springing up a cloud of dust at my ankles. You head on home, Ralph. I'll take it from here. Whatever he'd muttered while walking off never reached me. 
Shining the flashlight ahead, I traced the graffiti festooned walls. There was always more when I came here, like a new generation added to the mold. The passage to my left opened up to a wide concrete room lined with machinery. Ancient pulleys once used to hoist things up the silo's funnel now caked in soot and grime like a fossil's vertebrae. As I moved to inspect the area, a distant sound resonated from the shaft behind me. I followed after it, kicking up puffs of ash dust with every step. Even though I'd often been called to this place, it was still very easy to get lost in the tunnels that snaked beneath the structure. It was like walking down a dark throat to a stomach that still smelled of fermented grain. Large patches of the walls were still smeared black from where the fire had eaten them. Cut off from the outside world, I was left in the muffled thud of my footsteps and the excessive pounding sounds. Then something foul hit my nose, a putrid odor that changed the dark throat into a dark cold. I blew it out, clamping a hand over my mouth to keep from breathing it. My light flickered, burning away the shadows until it settled on a shape slumped against the wall. A man. His neck was drooped and hanging at a bent angle. He was facing a room across from him as though he had collapsed backward out of it and into the wall. Judging by the blood behind his head, it was a nasty spill. The hoodie he wore was peppered with holes, a knife's handle still jutting out of one of them. Stab wounds, at least six of them. I realized then that the wretched odor I'd been smelling was coming from his bowels. Just as I moved to check him for signs of life, a loud thud came from the room he sat across from. Only this time, it was punctuated by a resounding wet crunch. Hand on my sidearm, I leaned over my shoulder and glanced inside the room. It was pitch black, and within the dimness, a figure's arms rose and fell violently. Another sound echoed, the squelch of something organic. I veered around the corner, gun drawn and flashlight scattering the darkness. Police. Hands up. Something heavy hit the floor. The figure drew back sharply and clambered away a white face sheened with blood. Please. The man whimpered, eyes bulging with panic. A piece of duct tape was noosed around one of his wrists. I ordered him to the ground. He didn't protest. Sprawled out between us was another man, a red spongy ditch where his face should have been. Spurts of blood still pulsed from the sagging folds. Bits of bone, teeth, and brain perforated the floor. The left eye had been smashed into the nasal cavity, and resting next to its deformed figure was the murder weapon, a sizable chunk of stained concrete. I looked away. I had to. The need to vomit squeezed my gut but shrank back. It was for moments like these, in the raw grid of chaos, that we were trained to steal our nerves. Death was a part of the job, and even in quiet Colby, he witnessed all of its guises. Control the situation, my instructor used to say. Take a breath, put the thoughts somewhere else, board them off somewhere for a therapist to pry open I don't give a shit, just get the job done. I moved past the corpse and cuffed the trembling man, reciting the Miranda as I frisked his pockets. Do you understand these rights? He said nothing his gaze flat on the floor and hundreds of miles away. I hoisted him back to his feet and asked again, louder this time, answer the question. Do you understand these rites? They wanted to make me an angel. He murmured the blood on his neck, not even his own, already drying into a flaky crust. A bright, shiny angel. Can you tell me what your name is? His eyes swiveled toward me, machete in bright veins. Angels, angels, angels. That's what they kept saying. I didn't want it. They were bad people. Drugs. Maybe LSD or ketamine. Something had to have been racing around his system, jumbling up all the parts. That was typically the case for suspects like this flashing in and out of coherence like the devil himself were whispering sweet nothings in their ear. To make matters worse, the man had nothing on him. No license, no credentials, nothing to his name but the shirt on his back, sodden and red. 10 to 40 to dispatch. I've got a few bodies here at location Windsor Mill Grain Elevator. Possible homicide. Suspect is in my custody. Copy that, the voice crackled. Sending available units your way. I steered the man toward the exit, blocking out his deranged muttering. At that point, I'd have given my left testicle for some fresh air. Then something caught my eye, a large circle inlaid with six concentric rings. 
It looked like more than a mere tag, not sprayed, but smeared over the wall in a red, waxy residue. Gray chalky writings filled each ring that almost seemed to lean and spiral toward the circle's center. I couldn't come close to reading it. The writing was to jagged and obscure, like a cave drawing. A mild jitter rolled down my neck which only worsened as I traced the walls, finding the same sigil scrawled again and again. Cultish crests made up of celestial shapes. A few empty jars lined the corner, one of them in shattered pieces. Something sprang into my peripheral, a fold of shadow snapping forward. I whipped the light toward it. A gray cat was poised at the entrance, the mouse it just caught still wriggling in its jaws. I kicked some dust at it, sending the scrawny thing bolting down the dark halls. Without warning, the cuffed man lurched forward as if to vomit, ripping right out of my grasp. I went for my taser, fully expecting him to break for the exit. If only that was what happened. Instead, he ran the length of the room, circling it over and over. After a good three or four times, his running slowed and altered into squirming wild fits like a swarm of bees were smothering him. Considering his broken bulb of a mind, I wasn't that shocked. It was then, as a horrible scream rushed out of his throat, that I noticed something other than blood and shit in the air something burning. Plumes of smoke had started to waft from his clothes. All at once, a trail of blue flames shot up his leg and lapped up his sides. It happened so fast I barely had time to catch the flames unfurl across his chest. Within seconds, he was engulfed by them. Hot air spewed outward in a sort of flume. The room flared up, spotlighting the copious sigils and our large misshapen shadows. On the ground, roll on the ground now. I shouted over the piercing echo of his agony. His lit bony frame flailed about the room until it smacked into the wall and flopped onto the floor, worming around wildly. Before I could move to stamp the flames out, they'd already risen to a sputtering thicket. A chorus of dying cells. Human smoke blazed the ceiling and gave rise to a slew of new scents, fat frying on a stove, burning rubber, and pennies coated in charcoal. Fumes smeared my face with sweat and prickled the inside of my throat. The flames guttered, feeding off the air around him, and beneath them, his screams had changed into a guttural hiss the sound of a tongue finally starting to sizzle. I needed an extinguisher, a bucket of water, a puddle of fucking piss anything. Considering my options, I pawed for my gun and unholstered it. At that rate, it was either let the poor bastard burn or put him out of his misery. Already straining to make out the human shape within the blaze, I took aim, held my breath, and pulled the trigger. His body convulsed once from the first bullet and went limp after the second. I pried my eyes from the sight, realizing only then how much they hurt. There hadn't been any gas, no substance drenched over his clothes, and no device in his pockets. It just happened poop. I needed air, a moment to let my wits fall back into place. Then he started to move again. At first, I passed it off as his body curling into itself like charring paper. No. The man rolled over, struggled to his knees, and stood back up. I was convinced the smoke had finally reached my brain and choked it. The man who had burned to death, the one whom I'd shot twice, was now standing ramrod straight, staring back at me. His face was tight and blackened with an angry crust. Flakes of his own carbonized skin danced in the air. His now melted eyes ran down his cheeks in thick trails. What skin remained was pulling apart like melting wax. Soft, sticky, patches of his bones were exposed and browning into dull, rusty colors. But despite how charred his features were, I could still make out the widest of smiles across his face. Head tilted, happy as a clam, as though blissfully unaware of the fire digesting him. A smile unfit for humanity. Mad thoughts flashed through my mind, repeating the same words, an angel. A bright and shiny angel. The man's gnarled head cocked this way and that as though soaking up the room for the first time. No, I take that back. At that point, the shriveled, crusty face of the thing in front of me belonged to something else. It was eyeing me somehow behind the brittle film that filled its empty sockets. A look of awareness. This wasn't a freak accident, not some trick of the light, but a transition. I could hear the disembodied voice of a narrator describe the scene. Watch carefully as it moves from one stage of its life cycle to the next, a beautiful metamorphosis. 
Yes, that's what it was. The light. A sleeping god finally able to stir. I didn't feel the gun go off, but I knew I clicked the trigger three times. Maybe more. The flames wobbled as the thing staggered back, several new holes now in its chest. Still, it did not drop that jovial smile. From behind, the handcuffs snapped as the chain link pulled feebly apart. Somewhere in my thoughts, a thin shriek resonated. I expected a reaction from what I'd done, maybe even retaliation. Instead, the thing turned away from me and put its focus on the largest of the sigils at the back of the room. Drunkenly, it hobbled toward it. Black disintegrated clods that were once closed fell from its frame. When it reached the circle, I could only watch as it practically fell into it, went limp, and began to break apart. Layer by layer, its body crumbled and lost its structure into powdery fragments. A great heap of charcoal dust formed at its feet in mounds of black sand. As more of its shape collapsed, the flames slackened and continued to wither until both were no more. The room once again returned to darkness. A voice chattered over the radio, only to join the faint frequency of my shock. I shined my light over the sigil, heat still radiating off of it, and scarred over its center was the vague silhouette of a man, left behind like an atomic shadow. Asterisk, 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 asterisk on May 6, 2020, at approximately 2 a.m., a gray cargo van pulled off beside the road and parked on the north end of the Windsor Mill Grain Elevator. According to the camera feed, two males left the vehicle, opened their trunk, and dragged out a third unidentified male appearing bound by some means. They proceeded to cut their way through the fence and enter the grounds. Both individuals were later identified as Peter and Elliot Mosley, brothers. After their arrival, at approximately 02 for 5, I, Officer Tucker was dispatched in reference to the disturbance. By the time I arrived on the scene and located both suspects, they had succumbed to severe injuries, one by several stab wounds, the other by a crushed skull from a slab of concrete. Both brothers were pronounced dead at the scene. A number of symbols were painted around the room, signifying some unknown ceremonial practices. It can be deduced that the third male broke free from his restraints and killed both men. I quickly secured the man, but was unable to question him, most likely due to narcotics. Before I could bring him into custody by some unknown means, he had lit himself ablaze, perhaps by some sort of suicide. Suicide, that's what I called it in the report. It felt so wrong, a counterfeit truth I could swallow easily. And yet, it could not wall me off from the nightmare. Practically any lick of sleep I could get was jolted aside by the stink of burning hair or the sight of a man-shaped figure in the corner smiling ever so wildly. I requested the body cam footage and showed it to a buddy of mine at the station. His response? A passive shoulder roll. The guy was hopped up on God knows what, of course. He couldn't feel his nerves melting. By that point, he was probably thinking, boy, it's stuffy in here. It's crazy what the shit out there can do to people, almost like it makes them superhuman or something. I'd him irritably, would it also make them combust? He laughed. I didn't. I tried to convince myself he was right. I really did, but it was no use. Somewhere in all this, there was a hole that kept growing deeper. As I put in the request for a lateral transfer, my paranoia only worsened. I feared that whatever was inside that man, Maybe something in the air had also slipped into me, festering, waiting to ignite a bright, shiny angel. Inevitably, I'd have to go back to that place if another trespassing happened and God knows it would. Whenever that thought returned, the world around me only went grayer. The identity of the kidnapped man was still working its way through our system, so I looked into the brothers, Peter and Elliot Mosley. No such luck, both their records were clean. The two had made the drive to Colby from a small town near Colorado. I checked the history of the town, searching for any house fires, occult crime, or calamities that struck the residents. What can I say? I was desperate. My search led me to an abandoned, burned-down church that rested on the outskirts of the community. Minuscule as it was, a lead was a lead. I honestly didn't think I'd find anything in the old, rotted woodwork and splintered flooring. 
But lo and behold, tucked away along the scorched outer wall was the familiar faded shape of their sigil, the exact one I'd seen. It was hard to tell, but it almost looked as though the black smear of a hand had been streaked over it. About the symbol's meaning, I was able to find someone online who transcribed one of its rings using an old Hungarian alphabet system. F-R-E-O-F-F-L-E-S-H, I don't know how far I'll get in all of this, and frankly, I'm terrified to keep going. What did it all mean? Were the others out there doing this to people? Was it happening now, in another forgotten, burnt-up place? Despite all my questions, one thing was certain to me. In the dark halls of Windsor Mill, even the angels burned. 